Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, firstly, let me just start off by saying, um, you can see from my expression how happy I am that we're back in school. It feels like a school again. I am on cloud nine, believe it or not. Just walking around the school, some of the pupils have been saying to me, sir, why are you smiling so much? And I'm saying, you don't understand. It's so good to have pupils back in school. So everything's been going really well. And actually, it feels more like they were on a long weekend. It doesn't feel like they were off from school for two and a half months. And just walking around school, it is really, really calm, really purposeful. Pupils have really picked up where we left off in, in December. And it's a real testament to the teachers, to the systems we have here in school. And I know that pupils will catch up. We will not use COVID as an excuse because we're going to work hard day in, day out to make sure your children don't fall behind in any way. So today's workshop, um, thank you very much for signing up. It's about understanding and managing behavior, something that we do every day in school. And it's really good that you, you, you log in because I think we have to have home and school working together if we're going to have um, you know, the best students um, in five or seven years time. It, it isn't just about the education. It isn't just about the grade eight, grade nine and the grade eight. It's about the kind of person that we want to develop, how they deal with their emotions. How do we get them to understand that, yes, you are going to get things wrong, but how do you deal with those? and how you react to when things happen to you, that is not necessarily your fault. And I think it's really important that those skills are taught to pupils and not just left by chance. So we have Ms. Francis, my assistant head, who leads on, um, the, who, who's in charge of Senko. We have Amal, um, who we're really, really pleased to have. And also we have Mandy, who has joined us today for this workshop. So I'm gonna hand over to uh, Ms. Francis, who will uh, take you through what's happening today. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, so, yeah, to reiterate, Mr. Wilson, we are so happy that you have uh, arrived tonight and we are really thankful that you've decided to attend these series of workshops. Uh, we've got a series of four workshops across the next few weeks. We hope you'll look forward to attending and we really, really think that it's going to be beneficial to you and to your families, learning new skills, strategies and ways to cope at this time uh, where we're all experiencing for the first time this new way of of living, working and, and being together. Um, so just to let you know, I want to first of all welcome you all, understand how you are today. It's been, a, I know it's Monday and it's a long day and it's late, but we're really, really grateful that you're here and that you're listening and you're with us uh, because ultimately we are here for you to serve you and your young people and we want the best from them and hope that by working together, as Mr. Wilson said, we can get the best from them. So I want to make sure you're sitting somewhere comfortable, get yourself some water, a cup of tea if you haven't already, and we encourage you to use where you'd like to the chat function here in Teams to ask any questions, make any comments or anything you'd like to contribute. We're happy to hear. Now, just to warn you that this session is recorded. Um, we are happy for you. If you'd like to contribute verbally, you can do that. Um, you can unmute yourself and you can put your camera on to speak to us all as a group. And we'd love you to take this opportunity to be honest and share your thoughts, strategies, advice, um, and come together as a community to help and support each other. Um, I must ask you not to name your uh, young person, your son or daughter, um, because this is an open forum. Um, of course, we would like these things to be confidential within this group. If anything is shared that we feel concerning um, to us and the safety of your young people, we will forward them to our safeguarding officer. So we're really, really happy to have you. Um, I'm going to introduce you, first of all, to Amal, who is our EP, uh, our educational psychologist, um, and also to Mandy, who is our mental health practitioner at the school. Um, but thank you again. I look forward to answering any of your questions. As I see questions arriving in the chat, I will stop um, Amal and Mandy and we'll address some of those. And we'll also be taking questions at the end. Um, our email addresses are there. If you'd have any other questions that you'd like to address privately or confidentially, please don't hesitate to email me. Over to you, Amal. Thanks very much. Mandy, do you want to say anything before we get started about your role? Um, just yes, thank you. It's just it's quite a new role in school. So my, my title is an education mental health practitioner um, and I'll, I'll be working in school one day a week. 
and um, I might be working one to one with young people that are referred, your children that are referred to the service and also delivering things like this, like workshops and group group work in school. Thank you, Amal. Great. Um, as Cassie already said, so I'm the school educational psychologist, so I work very closely with Cassie um, and similarly um, I work on an individual basis with young people or I'm involved in delivering training for, for parents like yourself or for the staff as well. So just as already we've mentioned, we've got four upcoming sessions that we've essentially designed and we're hoping to deliver to you. Um, I guess I, the first thing I want to say is thank you for all of those who filled in and put some questions down in the attendance form. We've had a look at some of the questions and some of the areas that you would like for us to, to basically answer through these workshops. Um, and I'm confident between now and the next three workshops that will answer most of your questions. Uh, but today's session, we're going to be focusing predominantly around understanding and managing behaviour. Um, a lot of the questions that we had in the queries was that parents were asking that they if we could really focus on teenagers um, and that's what these workshops will do we'll be really looking at all these different aspects from um, an adolescence perspective and really thinking about how we can unpick that behavior our second session will be looking at developing positive relationship again there was a lot of questions around how do we support the emotional regulation of children in who are, who are teenagers um, and we're definitely going to be covering that in our second session where we're going to be giving you guys skills around emotional coaching and the four steps that are associated with that. Again, we had some questions around social media, screen times, safety, and, and we hope to cover a lot of that around in our session three, social media and e-safety. And our last session is going to be around strategies and intervention to support well-being. Again, there was a lot of questions around how do you support anxious young people or stressed young people or how do you support young people who are presenting in a very um in an angry externalizing anger essentially um and i know some of you guys are very much interested in the brain development of adolescents and we'll definitely be sure to include that in session four as that's really pertinent when we're trying to understand things like anxiety in, in young people So in terms of hopes and aims for today's session, what we're hoping to really do today is think about what is behaviour and that's the focus of our session. We're going to be looking at behaviour from different lenses, including psychology. How do we interpret some of the behaviour from through a psychological lens? We're going to be thinking about how do we reframe unwanted behaviour, behaviour that you might see in a young person that you think that behaviour is not acceptable or not wanted or not warranted what can we do about that we're also going to be focusing on language language is such an important vehicle to essentially develop a positive relationship with a young person so we're going to be thinking about what language should we be using to describe unwanted behavior and finally we're also going to be thinking about some strategies that you could use at home with your young person okay so as parents um you might have noticed a change in your child and you might be noticing some some new and different behavior and as a parent myself i know that that can be quite a surprise but you might be experiencing mood swings um they want to spend less time with you wanting to go to their bedroom more not wanting to talk closing down um pushing boundaries challenging the rules that once they might have um, adhered to but are now an, are not so compliant being argumentative and this this can be really irrational um you know doesn't make sense at all and also risky behavior so maybe this is a, a bit of a chance for for you to join in um i wonder what your thoughts are is what is behavior what does behavior mean to you and if you could call out or pop some comments in the chat that would be great although I can't see. You're welcome also to use the raise hand feature on Teams. If you'd like to raise your hand to speak, that's fine. Cathy, Cathy will monitor that for us if you can't see. Oh, thank you, because I can't see what's coming up in the chat. Yep, certainly. If there's any parent that like to maybe 
contribute at this point, please feel free to, to just shout out. Nothing in the chat so far, never mind. We'll warm you up a little bit, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, we'll warm you up a little bit. Maybe it was a bit too early for everybody. <laughs> okay, so one of the first things when we think about what is behaviour is that all behaviour is a form of communication. And so essentially what we see on the surface can sometimes give us glue, clues about un, unmet needs, fears or worries. So a lot of you guys might be familiar with this idea of an iceberg. So an iceberg is a giant flowing, floating piece of ice that's often found in some of the coldest parts of the world. Um, and what often happens with an iceberg is that you can see the top of the iceberg, but you might not necessarily be able to see the bottom of the iceberg. And quite often behavior is exactly the same. So you might see the behavior that, is, that the young person is essentially demonstrating, but we might not necessarily be able to see what's happening underneath. So therefore, it's really important that we almost separate the top part, what we can see, from the emotional roots, everything that's under the water. So, and we need to also think about that behavior sometimes can be motivated by a variety of different feelings. So one of the things we ask ourselves is, so what is the behavior this young person is essentially demonstrating? What can we see? What can we hear? What are we observing? So that's everything on top of the water, that tip of the iceberg. But what is happening underneath? So for example, you might have a teenager who's what, 15, 16, who is really angry, who might be really upset, and they might be demonstrating this through um, aggression. They might be demonstrating this through, through their physical appearance in the sense of they might be grumpy, they might have mood swings, they might be slamming doors. And that's essentially everything that we can see. But one of the things I really want to invite you guys to, to have a think about is, if that's what we can see, what do we think is happening underneath for that young person? So still holding in mind what we just spoke about, that, you, that teenager who is really struggling and who's demonstrating aggressive behaviour, and we might see that as the fighting, the kicking, the hitting, the screaming, the biting and the throwing. Part of our role at this point as parents, as teachers, as adults that are essentially in this young person's life is to almost play detective at this point. And what we need to try and understand, OK, I can see aggressive behaviour, but what can't I see? What do I need to investigate? What's happening underneath the water for this young person? And it might be that that young person, although they might be demonstrating aggressive behavior, what they're really trying to say is, I need a break. You know, it might, it might be too much. I'm tired. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling really anxious. I'm not connecting with anybody. Nobody seems to understand me. You know, oh, I need to release my emotions. And that's everything underneath the surface. And one of the things that we see tend to see is that some people may see misbehavior and they might use reward or punishment to try and get compliance from a teenager. But quite often that doesn't address the underlying reason for the behavior. So you might say to them, you know, if you stop kicking, you know, and, and you don't kick for the week, uh, you can get a treat at the end. And that might work short term, but really is that addressing what's happening for that young person? Because at this point, what we might need to be thinking about is if they're feeling anxious, that behavior is still going to continue until we are able to really get to the bottom of it. So just to just to reiterate what Amala said and some things to remember about behavior is a communication. It, it is learnt. It's something that that children learn as time goes on um, and it serves a purpose. Um, it happens in context, so what happens socially, physically and in the environment, but also hold on to the fact that behaviour can change. So, you know, if, if some of these undesirable behaviours are coming in, then something can be done to, to alter that. So I want to introduce you guys to uh, uh, this 
Ericsson cycle social stages. According to Ericsson, who's a psychologist, basically he said that as individuals, we pass through eight different developmental stages that essentially build on each other. And at each stage, we face a crisis. And by resolving a crisis, we develop something he referred to as psychological strength or character character traits that help us to become more confident and healthy people. And I want to particularly draw your attention to the adolescent stage. So where you can see that it says 12 to 18. Um, and this stage is essentially categorized by identity versus role confusion. At this stage, your young person who's at that between those ages, it faces the challenges of developing a sense of self. They're forming their identity by examining their beliefs, their goals and their values. And the kind of question they're going to be asking themselves at this stage of their development is, who am I? What do I want to do? How do I fit into society? How do I contribute to society? So there's going to be so many confusing questions at this stage of their development that they're trying to figure out. And then on top of that, we have to remember is they're going through such a physical change as well as brain, a brain development. So on top of that, they're asking themselves, what's happening to my body? And, you know, I invite you at this point to really remember to go back and remember when you were at this stage of your development, when you were 12 to 18 and remembering what that really felt like, that turmoil and um, and really one of the things we want to try and think about here is on their journey to their sense of self most adolescents at this stage will explore different roles ideas and they will be pushing boundaries and quite often that does result or contribute to risky behavior which mandy you're going to touch a little bit on yeah just um you might think as your child is getting older that they'll become more sensible and but sometimes this is, isn't always the case as you know as they're on this journey and they're finding out who they are that sometimes that that sensible um behavior doesn't kick in until quite a bit later and you might think well would that you know why did they do that that seems so unreasonable but this is all part of their work that they're doing to find out who they are where they fit in what they can do what they can't do um and ultimately you know forms who who they are absolutely so one of the questions we often quite we get is how can I help my, uh, my child <coughs> excuse me my child successfully resolve some of the psychological and social conflict that occurs at this and one of the things I always say to parents is at this stage it's really about encouragement it's about reinforcing your child or your young person and really helping them to shape their personal identities you know, your your child is going to be looking around the world and looking around their surroundings, including you, to try and really build their sense of self. And one of the things that we really need to bear in mind is not to try and pressure them to conform to our own values and norms, but instead allow them to be able to essentially test the waters and try to understand their own values and build their own identity. Another quick theory that I really wanted to introduce was Manslow's hierarchy of need. Now, this is actually one of my favorite, um, I would say favorite psychological theories because it's so true to today's world. And when we're thinking about the pandemic that we're going through and when we're thinking about everything that's happening around the world, Maslow basically said that in order our, our most basic needs such as food and sleep are the foundation to everything. So quite often what we're seeing nowadays is that young people are struggling with things like sleep and exercise. So in order for them to be able to get to the top of the pyramid, their psychological needs such as food and sleep need to be met. So we can't get to the pyramid, to the top of the pyramid without meeting these needs. Young people need to feel rested, comfortable, safe and loved before they can develop socially and emotionally and cognitively. So before we can really think about their self-esteem, before we can really think about helping them to achieve their full potential, we need to think about the bottom of the pyramid. Are their physical, physiological needs being met? Do they feel safe? You know, 
one of the biggest things that we say is in order for a child or young person to learn, a prerequisite to that is feeling safe. And then after that, it's about belonging and feeling loved. And then that goes on to their self-esteem before we can support them to meet their full potential. So, you know, we can't we can't do any training now without really talking about the the pandemic and the effect that it's had on learning and behavior within schools. And yes, you know, we as, as children and young people and, and adults ourselves, we have observed a lot of stress, death and loss. You know, there's been so many changes that happened as a consequences of, of this pandemic. And that has really affected the way in which young people are behaving in the way in which they're able to concentrate and attend. And, and that's really important for us to hold that in mind. You know, we're still going through this pandemic. And what that's really had an effect on is on relationship. Relationship between siblings, that's had a, a, an impact on relationship between teacher and, and student, between parent and child. Um, and although all of this stuff has occurred as part of the pandemic, one of the things that we have observed also as well, lots of positive, more than ever before we have seen such compassion between communities, between students, between teachers and, 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 and students. And we've also seen young people really build their resilience as part of this pandemic that we're going, going through. And that has created so many opportunities, new ways of learning, new relationship. It's allowed young people to really be flexible as well and, and, and to cope through this. Randy, did you want to touch on anything on, on this line? Um, no, I, I think, you know, just generally, just we, we sometimes we focus on the negative, but it's I think that we have seen so much resilience from from the young people and how they've coped and managed in so many changes and si different situations that they've had to cope with. And I think that we don't always give them the credit um, that maybe they deserve of coping through this. Absolutely. Um, so I think so thinking about, you know, young people and their behaviour and um, how if you, you're in this this vicious cycle of, you know, nothing's changing, it might be really important to be thinking about about the, the, the behaviour is not the child. The behaviour is something separate. It is a communication. And, you know, how do we how do we separate that? So we, it's good to hold in mind that we're making the behaviour unacceptable, not the child. Sometimes we fall in a lot into um, the phrases that we say, you're always this, or you, um, it's the, 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 te the terminology that we use and the, the, the words that we use, we're probably going to be thinking about. Um, also focusing on the behaviour rather than the person, it's likely to leave, lead to improved behaviour and linking that poor behavior to a young person's identity or personality it won't help that change happen you know it inhibits positive change so in thinking about that and thinking about the, the way that we speak to young people um probably going to put you on the spot again maybe we could try this again and i wonder if there's any any parents that would like to contribute in thinking about what kind of phrases that they might be able to use um you know, if you if your child is displaying some inappropriate behaviour, how you could separate that behaviour from from the child. If anybody's got any suggestions, please put in the chat or call out. Can I speak? Please do. Yes, please. Hi. Hello. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Usually I never address him with you when I want to complain about his behaviour. I just say it is not acceptable or let's try to improve this. I always get myself involved in that as well. I never complain just about him or his behavior. So I'm, I'm, I'm also mentioning myself and try to help him to be as a team. Mm. So I never put my finger on him and I never say you yeah. when I want to kind of say. That's really important. I think sometimes you can you can get caught in the behaviour and, and think of that person, you know, if they're not tidying up, you are lazy, you never do this, you're always laying around. 
direct or is very directed at that person and like you say taking that away from the person and making it about the action or the behavior creates a different in response i think natasha mm. did you want to add something your hands up thank you yeah hi welcome um welcome sorry hi everybody um yeah no just in regards to certain uh conversations that i have with my son is that i feel here we go in saying that is that instead of like you make me feel this way or what you're doing and this is this is your fault but, but in fact like this is how i feel about it you know whether you agree with it or not this is my feelings on it and and equally you know for other people how do you think they would feel about that so i i was told that a long time ago that instead of putting your feelings on on others just express your feelings and don't blame others for what it is you're feeling because obviously they have no control over that but I think that really helps in, in the conversations that I have with my son is that actually, you know, your behaviour, this is how I feel about it, you know, and actually this is what we can improve on, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, that was that was another thing that I tend to do myself as well. Lovely. Yeah, That's a lovely you. example. Yeah. I mean, some of, some of the other phrases that we can use, it might be, um, I'd like to understand what caused you to behave that way. Um, can you explain to me how you're feeling? I like you, but I don't like the behaviour you're you're just displaying. Um, I think we've already touched on this. The consequences for that behaviour are, um, and also give given an, an opportunity to think about what could be changed next time. Um, also, maybe why was that swearing or hitting happening earlier, rather than why are you always hitting? Yeah, I think and Nadia has put in the chat there, Mandy, exactly that. Trying to focus. On the specific context and that specific incident and not making it about a big uh, occasion or, or a behavior that is something that that child always does or that is who they are as a person somebody yeah. else has put here a uh, question do you think you are acting in the right way do you think your behavior is going to help you can we find a different way to solve that daniela's put in the chat there nice questions there absolutely and i love daniela the fact that you offered an alternative way of that behavior so you've said can we find an alternative way to express that same emotion or that feeling so that yeah. i think that's lovely we sometimes we might also need to pick our moment when we do when we do talk about these things if a, if you know if your if your child is very upset or very angry it might not be the right that moment might not be the right time to have that that quite um in depth conversation so picking your moment also might be quite useful hmm. I think you're absolutely right. One of the biggest things that I always reflect on is if you've got two people who are dysregulated, so for example, your young person is upset and you're upset, having a conversation trying to resolve a particular situation, that's not the best time for either of you. Sometimes it's best to almost walk away from that and then come back maybe even later in the evening, a couple of hours where you're both more settled and you're able to have a conversation where you're both able, able to reflect on what took place. Okay. But this the theme of behaviour. One of the things that we always try to encourage is parents to think about is, is there an alternative explanation for that young person's behaviour? For example, if a young person is kicking and screaming or, or doing something that you feel that is unacceptable, Really asking yourself, you know, do they, A, do they have a self, are they aware of what they're doing? Um, you know, do they have the capacity to essentially self-regulate in that moment? Quite often we expect young people, particularly when they're through adolescence, to be able to just regulate their emotion. You know, they might blow, like blow the lid essentially, but actually we're saying, well, you're, you're almost an adult now you should be able to express yourself in a way that's not aggressive or that's not a, that doesn't mean that you get upset but quite often that young person might not have yet developed those skills and part of our role is thinking about are they behaving that way because they don't know how to self-regulate is there any i would almost like to invite everybody is there any explanation that perhaps that you can think of alternative explanation for why a young person might behave in a particular way? Can I say one, Amal? Maybe um, because that is what they see as themselves, that is what they see from their parents, their family surrounding them. 
if all they see is shouting in a response to a reaction or if they see you dealing with something in a certain way that modeling of that behavior is a way that they feel is the way that perhaps they should then react as well you know they learn from us as much as they as they can in terms of their behavior and the things they do and if that's all they have ever seen then that is all the only way that they will ever act i think absolutely cassie i think that's a really good good example of of the importance of how young people learn through their environment and they pick up through modeling and modeling can be both positive and negative as well um danielle has put in here in the chat that they sometimes behave in a way for our attention because they want our attention want to see, be seen absolutely and i think that goes to the point of quite often you know remembering that stage of development we're talking about they're really trying to figure themselves out they're really trying to form an identity at this point and they really are questioning everything around their environment and that might be their way of, of trying to get your attention they might be pushing the boundaries to really see if you're holding them in mind natasha's put here puberty so physical development is really important absolutely that's a really really important one and it kind of goes back to what we were saying that you know as they're navigating through the world and they're developing their identity there's so much changes that's also happening within their body and they're going through so much changes so that adds another layer of, of confusion as they navigate through this really interesting adolescence period okay so there's a lovely little poster here and thinking about reframing reframing the behavior so you know this is this is also our way of of looking at things some slightly differently so you might have your child and before you might have considered well they won't do it you know that they, they're just being difficult if we could reframe that and we could think of that in a in a different way and think well at the moment they can't do it so wonder what why not let's and we've all got different stances you've got you've got your perspective you've got your child's perspective um, but it's really helpful to be curious around why things aren't going well. Um, and as you can see here, you've, you know, you've got your mindset, you've got the view of the child, you know, talking a lot, um, having that thought, um, you know, you might think he's lazy, but then there might be another reason. Is the work too hard? Um, all sorts of reasons as going back to the iceberg, you know, you're only seeing 10% of what's going on. Our responses play a big part in this, um, depending on then how the child responds, um, the child's experience. So I think that's a really nice little poster to help. And Amal, I don't know, will the parents get anything um, to take away from this? Absolutely, to... I mean, I can email Cassie this particular frame, uh, this picture, and absolutely parents can get a copy of it. I think what's really nice is almost sticking it on the fridge so you're, everybody's aware of it. Yeah. Because um, I think when young people exhibit certain challenging behaviour, you know, our, part of our role as adults, as we were saying, is to be detectives, to really try and pick what some of the barriers are. And then as we unpick, try to put things in place for them. Um, and, and I love this picture because it reminds us to do that. So if you look at the bottom, it says, if you find a stressor for a young person, reduce those stressors. If you're finding unmet needs, meet those needs. So the unmet needs could be things like that young person might be feeling neglected or they might feel like not loved or they might feel like they're not being held in mind. You know, they, if that's how they hold, that's what they're holding in mind, let's show them an alternative. Mm. If I was thinking... Still, hmm? Go on, Mandy, sorry. sorry. I was I was thinking um, when we were talking just now about that, you know, they might need attention and so they might want attention. And sometimes that can evoke a negative response, I think, in some people um, that it's almost as if like, well, if they're attention seeking, I'm not going to give it to them. But it's I think it's important to listen to to that what that child needs. Why do they need that attention? What what can I do to change this so that they get attention in a different way rather than the, the negative um, responses that they might get from from poor behaviour. Absolutely, and and the fact that they're teenagers doesn't change that. You know, just because they're teenagers and 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 you know they've hit a, a growth span and some of the some of them might be taller than you, that still doesn't change the fact that you know they could simply be behaving in a certain way to get your attention, to yeah. to to feel 
to, you know, for because they have unmet needs. And, you know, part of our role, as I said, is to be detectives at this stage. OK, so we're going to think a little bit about <coughs> strategies now. What are some of the things that we can see or do when a young person behaves in a way that is undesirable? So one of the biggest things that we really wanted to touch on is language. So the language that you use is really important. So we kind of already touched on this, but really separating the young person from the behavior, stating exactly what you want them to do. Sometimes what happens is when you're engaging in, when you're trying to get them to reframe a behavior, sometimes we use so much language and this young person is already dysregulated so they might already be experiencing heightened emotions and we're literally just giving them lots of instructions. Sometimes that's not the best way for us to do that. So remembering sometimes that saying as little as possible could actually have a more positive impact on the young person. Really thinking about the choices of language that we're using, knowing that things like threat does not work, but giving them choices when in fact that they when they feel that they don't have a choice. So imagine a young person's unmet need is that they always feel like they've got no control over their life. Actually, by us giving them choices, that's almost like empowering them. Another key, big area is around acknowledging how they might be feeling. I think, again, because they're teenagers, quite often we take for granted or we think, well, they should be able to tell me how they're feeling because they're behaving in a certain way. And sometimes they might not have that language or they might have that language, but because they're so dysregulated at that point, they're so upset or emotionally heightened, they might not have that language available to them right there and then. That language might not be accessible. So one of the things that we can do as adults around a young person is actually name those emotions for them and say, I know you're angry or I can see that you're angry or your behavior is showing me that you're really upset or that you're really distressed. Um, and remember, labeling the behavior, not the young person. So we kind of said that already, we kind of touched on this, but really we wanted to come back to that because this is such an important strategy. Really thinking about, you know, this behavior is unacceptable rather than what you are doing is unacceptable. Really taking the you out of that labeling of the behavior. Introducing desirable, desirable behavior. I think somebody in the chat said that, um, said it really beautifully that every time they want to reframe a behavior, they give that young person an alternative behavior. Being really specific in terms of how we praise, not just saying well done, or, but saying, you know, I can see you were really upset, but I really appreciated how you didn't slam the door, you didn't raise your voice and how you remain calm. And actually next time, you know, making sure we can do something like that again. And I think, you know, one of the things that we want to do at this stage is really encouraging young people to make decisions and choices and really holding in mind what stage of development they are. They really are, you know, trying to build their identity at this stage. They're really trying to push boundaries. They're trying to navigate their environment. And using some of these strategies can really support them and support us to really separate that behavior and, and to understand and manage the behavior. So some, some other strategies are when, when you've got your, a young person that's um, dysregulated, even, even yourself when you're feeling um, upset, you're maybe in the red angry zone, doing some grounding exercises are really useful. And, you know, these are things that you might be able to learn together after you've had a chat about, you know, feelings and how you can regulate your feelings. So we've got some we've got three here to just to talk through, but there's lots on Google and what doesn't work for one person works for another. So it's about finding something that actually works for you. And again, your child might might find something completely different to you that works for them. Um, so we've got uh, we've got this. There's the soles of the feet. And this is where you might um, you might sit and have both feet on the floor. You bring both you bring your attention to to both feet on the floor and you could do this 
anywhere you know if you're at home and you're sitting in a chair you might take your shoes and socks off or if you're out somewhere and you just feel feeling that you need a little bit of grounding um notice your feet on the floor notice your feet in your socks it's about bringing your thinking to your feet um and then one by one gradually maybe push the weight onto one foot and leave it there for a few seconds and then put some pressure on the other foot for a few seconds and then put pressure on both feet um, you can hold in between and release and do that as many times as you feel until you're feeling a bit calmer um, then there's an, another activity um, grab it says uh, grab a non-academic book. I think that's quite important, especially when you're maybe you're working with a young person or your, your child's upset. And um, the last thing they probably want is a school book to do this activity from um, and a sheet of paper and count how many letters there are on the page or count how many blue things you can see in the room. Um, there's lots of it says there. there's lots of types of exercises to help to re reduce anxiety by focusing on your brain's specific task that is unrelated to your work. Um, another one might be looking around the room and finding three green things, three blue things. And you can adapt these also to, you know, the, the ability of your child. Um, another easy one to do that you can do anywhere is your five senses. So you might look around and see five things that you can see, four things that you can feel. That might be a piece of clothing or the desk maybe that you're sitting at. Three things that you can hear. Um, and that might be quite quite hard in a quiet space, so you might need to work quite hard on that, which is which is quite useful. Two things that you can smell, and if you can't smell something, you can think of something maybe that you enjoy, the smell of a particular flower or the smell of a perfume, and one thing that you can taste. And again, if you haven't eaten or drank anything for a while, you might like to choose your favourite sweet or your favourite food or your favourite drink to think about. Um, and I would also say, you know, just to add to that, I would kind of encourage you to try all of them with your young person and maybe you yeah. together selecting one or two that you both mm. really like. And again, maybe, you know, if it's the five senses, having that available somewhere in the living room or in the kitchen, somewhere you spend a lot of time um, and actually having it ready, ready. So if something was, if you wanted to, really think about managing your reducing each other's anxiety this is something that you could do together just a really quick breathing exercises the google is is very very helpful with those is there's lots there's lots on google mm -hmm. that you can find yeah thank you sorry it's francis okay so um top tips and i think maybe also what might be quite important if you're if you're going to bring in some changes is maybe talk to other members of your family let everybody know what's what's happening what you're thinking so that maybe you're all on the same page um talk to your child about it as well you know say that you want you want things to be a bit better so you're maybe you're going to try some different things so be patient and realistic um I think that, you know, the, the idea is that maybe you might be thinking, oh, that sounds a really good idea and it's it's going to be magic. But generally it might not be and it might take a while and it might take some practice and also things might get worse before they get better. So it's really important to stick at it. Um, be consistent. Uh, I think that probably goes without saying that, you know, if you try one thing one day and it works and you try it the next day and then you stop doing it for a couple of days. It, it probably won't have as good an impact. So um, keep it consistent and keep discussing how strategies are progressing and, and talking about it. Um, so supporting effective communication. So sometimes it's really difficult for people to communicate how they're feeling, what they what they need. Um, I think we've talked about this before, speaking clearly using short sentences, um, be precise about what your what your expectation is, what you're um, what you're asking your child to do. This helps them not to feel overloaded and not to have too much information. Um, also, 
to be able to identify emotions some some young people find this really difficult but there's lots of ways that you can you can help this you can use um visuals emojis are really good you know most young people use emojis on their phones so you can use emojis to identify feelings um you might be able to use something like something called a check-in thermometer there's lots of these again on google some people use colors some people there's um some examples of cats pulling particular expressions again it's probably something that would be useful to use to find something that that your child is interested in and would, would engage in rather than um just something that that maybe you've just picked out of off of google so try and find something that you both enjoy um if the young person if you're if the young person can identify that they're getting angry then they can try to do something themselves to calm down and by putting in some of the the skills that we were thinking about before using those before your child gets angry to introduce them when your child is calm and practice them before before they calm you know might be really helpful that they can put them in place because if they're angry they probably won't be able to use it. it to introduce it new when they're angry probably it wouldn't be the best time and i don't know if people have heard of social stories um and comic strips and again these can be a really useful way they're, they're written in a specific way and they can help to explain certain situations and difficult situations sometimes and there's um some on google there's some examples of how to use social stories and comic strips so what to do if the strategies are not working so you could if the situation doesn't seem to be getting better one of the biggest things that we always say is go to the beginning and really ask yourself some of these questions. Have you identified the right cause for the behaviour? So really thinking back into the iceberg that we we're speaking about and that actually we only see 10 percent of of what we what we observe. So do we really understand how we play detective enough? Have we unpicked that behaviour of what could potentially be happening for that young person? Do we need to investigate a little bit more? Another question to ask yourself is, are your expectations clear to the young person and are they appropriate? So that really links back to some of the things that we were saying around, you know, making sure that your language is clear, making sure that you're giving them strategies, making sure that the young person knows exactly what to expect from you, or what, rather what you expect from them. Are all the adults using strategies consistently? So, for example, if you are intending on introducing something like one of the grounding activities to really help us regulate ourselves and, and, and manage our emotion, is everybody in the house using that? Because actually that becomes a really nice, consistent way if, if, we, if you almost introduce that strategy as a family and everybody's familiar with it. And that actually, no matter who gets a little bit upset or whoever engages in certain behaviour, as a family, you can almost remind each other to take those breathing exercises, to, to do the five senses about, you know, five things that you can see. Are the rewards and sanctions used valuable to the young person? Ask them. You know, have a conversation about, you know, rewards and sanction and what that should look like, you know empower them by allowing them to be part of that conversation and can the young person easily carry out the replacement behavior sometimes you know we might ask a young person uh, we might introduce an alternative behavior to the young person but actually they're not quite there yet and we might need to almost go a step backwards and that's one of the things that you could be asking the young person okay you know although this behavior is unacceptable what do you think that we could do next time let them, you know, give empower them by allowing them to be part of that conversation. Let them choose that replacement behavior because actually they're more in control. If they've chosen their replacement behavior, they're more likely to be successful in implementing that. OK, so before we open the floor to questions, um, I quickly just wanted to introduce this value in action study that was done. And essentially what this study showed was that all of these strengths, every single person, regardless who you are and from what walks of life, we all display at least one strength that's been shown on this slide today. Some of us might be more aware of some of that strength than others. 
So what I would like you all to do right now is to reflect on a particular skill or strength that you see in yourself. And what we're going to do is, please don't type it in just yet. We're going to give you all about 60 seconds. And then when I say go, I would like everybody to pick one and release it at the exact same time. So pick a strength and then hold on to it until I say go. And then maybe Cassie, you can read it out for us afterwards. Kathy, Mandy, you might want to pick one as well. Thinking, it's hard to think about these things when it's the yourself, isn't it? <laughs> Give you another 10 seconds. You'll have it typed out. And then when I say go, you can all release it at the exact same time. Okay, if everybody could release their answers now. What a good mixture. Okay. Can you read some of them out? For Thank us? you, everyone. Yeah, so we've got curiosity, zest, spirituality, perseverance, another perseverance, kindness, love of learning hope, teamwork, kindness, kindness, and fairness, teamwork, lots there. Beautiful. So what I would like you, to, what I would like to invite you all is once you get a copy of the slides emailed out to you is have a go at this activity with your young person. Introduce it to them and then ask them, you know, what skill or strengths that they see in themselves. And actually some children or some young people might be able to pick one straight away. And some might find it a little bit difficult, but what's great about it is that you can have conversations around this. And you might even want to pick a couple for, for them and say, you know, as your parent or as your carer, I see this strength in you. I see humour. I see bravery. I see honesty. And that could be a really nice bonding um, conversation between you and your young person. Okay. So the final slide before we get to Q&A, and I always like to remind parents of this at every workshop that I do. Young people need parents and carers who take care of themselves. So one of the things that we always say is thinking back to that, almost that plane analogy. So imagine you're on a plane and the masks come down. It's so important that you're able to put on your mask first before you can help your young person. It's that same idea of, you can't pour from an empty cup. So you need to fill your cup in before you can help your young person. So, you know, we're here talking about young people and adolescents and managing behavior, but it's equally important that, you know, we remind ourselves to be kind to ourselves and to also make sure that, you know, we are in the best position so that we're able to support young people. Okay. We're going to open the floor to questions now, if anybody has any. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, Cassie will be monitoring that. Or if you want to raise your hand or just give us a shout. Um, and then between us, we will try and answer your questions that you may have. Even if you don't have any questions, I advise you to stick around because somebody might have a question that is relevant to you. Um, but if you have to shoot off, I'm going to put a quick evaluation form in the chat that I would love you to fill out before you do have to shoot off. Any questions, big or small, please put them in now and we'll do our best to answer. Any questions or hands up? And while people are thinking of questions, what we might share is that next week we've got our second session um, and we're going to be focusing around developing positive relationship with young people. Um, and we're going to be particularly focusing on emotional coaching. So really thinking about how do we support young people's emotional regulation, particularly during adolescence. 
Um, and we're also going to be having a go at some strategies that you can do at home with your young people. I've got one question here from Ms. Venegas. Yeah. Good evening all. Thank you very much, Amal, Mandy and Ms. Francis to put this together. It has been a pleasure to listen to, to the presentation and see the suggestions of parents. Um, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got a question actually. More than a question, what is your perspective about something? Um, as a team leader in the, in the school, as um, the, the one in charge of pastoral and behaviour, sometimes it's difficult to actually for parents to understand that it's so important for the parents to work together with the school in order to make the students um, behave in a certain way or change the habits of that those students have. From your own perspective, how important, uh, how efficient do parents work with the school? So how do parents work with the school? In how important is it that parents work with the school to get, to get the most of the child? Yeah. Absolutely. Cassie, do you want to have a go or do you want me to, to start? Yeah, I mean, I'm on the same team as Esther, so we kind of okay. share the same view, I think. But um, for us and for me, particularly coming at the perspective of students who need additional support, it is vitally important that parents work with the school so that we see the same child in school that you will see at home. And we're not seeing these Jekyll and Hyde characters that we sometimes do. Um, so it's really, really important for us that you are creating the same routines, the same environment um, that we are creating in school. So the expectations are clear and so that our rules and, and regulations and our routines are joined up in some way. So there's not this, um, I guess, um, tension between home and school. We want to be singing off the same hymn sheet. We want to be on the same team. We, you know, we've all got the same goal, which is to get the, get the best out of your, your young person. And, and for me, it's so, so important. It's the number one, you know, most important thing for us, really. Do you agree, Amal? Absolutely. And I think all I would add to that is consistency is key. If we are thinking about managing behaviour, if we are thinking about supporting a young person to reframe a behaviour, or we're trying to introduce a replacement behaviour, the only way in which it's going to be successful is consistency, consistency between home and school. So as Cassie was saying, it's so important that A, we share strategies. So if something works really well at home and you know, you, it's really important that you feed that back, feed it back to the year group, feed it back to the teacher or the form class um, and actually say, you know, when my young person gets upset, I've noticed that when I do this, this is really helpful. If you are aware of a strategy that's really supporting them, share it with school because actually that consistency in behaviour approach could be really is really important in trying to support a young person to to change their behaviour. Mm. But even down to small things as well. Mm. I mean, at school here at Hurlingham, we kind of insist on young people opening doors for each other and saying good morning and thank you and please and you insisting on those kind of behaviors at home are going to help us at school and us insisting on those behaviors at school are going to help you at home so we do need to make sure that that consistency like you say is there and is key for both of us and to benefit both of us really and ultimately the benefit that young person mm. and if you're unsure of some of the some of the way in which school are managing behavior ask you know, have a conversation with the classroom teacher or the year lead and say, what what are you doing in school so that you're aware of that and actually implementing it at home as well? So a perfect example is zones of regulation. Quite often that's introduced in schools. If you are aware that the school are essentially using the zones of regulation to support a young person, that's something that you could do at home as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Ms. Venegas. Great question. Any other questions from any other parents? These can be questions specific about school or about young people or managing behaviour, interactions, relationships, anything that we've touched on today, you're welcome to discuss or ask about. Nothing there yet? Okay. Okay. Um, so, I would like to say thank you very, very much for all of you for attending. I know it's a Monday night and I say you've probably got dinner to run off to, but thank you so much again for attending. Uh, we look forward to you attending next week's session. Um, please fill out the evaluation form um, and we would look, I say we look forward to seeing you next week. 
in the session is six o'clock same time on Monday and we'll send out the link to you again in the same way. It will also be on our school website page. Um, but if there are any questions you'd like answered again, please put them in the form um, and we'll do our best to get those answered for you next week um, on Monday. But thank you all very much. Thank you, Amal. Thank you, Mandy, for presenting. Um, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much, everyone.